This morning we have good news. <coughs> we have the news of Jesus. Does that bring a smile to your face? Amen. I hope it does. I hope that gets you excited. I hope that gives you energy. I hope that helps you, helps you to continue to move on in life and, and move forward. Uh, the, the name of Jesus still has the same effect it had in the moment of, of creation, and it will have the same effect in, in the moment when he comes to take his children home. That is the powerful name of Jesus. There is no other name like the name of Jesus. Jesus gives hope. He gives a happiness. He gives a joy like, like nothing else in life. That is the name of of Jesus. In fact, the Bible tells us that, that salvation is through who? It's through Jesus. It was Jesus that was given at the cross to die for your sins and mine. It was Jesus that was in the tomb, but it was that Jesus that resurrected and offers you this morning salvation. Do you know that the Bible speaks of that and sometimes it never fails. As I travel the state of Florida, I can stand behind a pulpit and I'm usually at a different pulpit every Sabbath and I will say, how many of you are saved? And we hesitate. We're not preaching once saved, always saved. That's not what we're saying this morning. I want to go on record for that because I'll get an email or a text somehow. But what I am saying is that the Bible says if you accept Jesus as the Son of God, if you accept Jesus as a risen Savior, if you accept Jesus as your personal Savior, you realize that He's coming back, that He's the Son of God. The Bible tells us that we as Christians, as followers of Jesus, will be there that day with Him. That's called salvation. That allows us to go forward. That allows us to continue in this life. And if you've only lived a little bit longer or if you've lived several years or enough, you know that this life is not always good. It's a beautiful and wonderful thing that we are shown so many stories in the Bible, so many different illustrations of how God, how Jesus cares for you. As I, was, as I was preparing for, for this sermon, I want you to know that I've preached the same sermon for 22 years. I go to every church and I preach the same sermon. And what I mean by that is the sermon is always and always will be about Jesus. Because Jesus gives that hope in life. Jesus gives us a smile because of that plan of salvation and reminds us every day that no matter what, he'll always be with us. Deuteronomy 4.31 says he's a merciful God. Deuteronomy 4.31 says that he'll always be with you and never forsake you. There's so many verses in the Bible, and I'll start with Isaiah 41.10. It says, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That is your God. That is the God that we have. So no matter what you go through, no matter how tough, whether it's in the good or the bad, that is the God that you serve. That's Jesus in our lives. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything. How many of us live with anxiety? How many of us wake up at 4 in the morning and pace the house because of the things that are going on in our lives or the things that, that we know of? Jesus says, cast your cares on me. That's another verse. Because he cares for you. We can read so many other verses in 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Isaiah 43, 1, but now this is what the Lord says, fear not for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. Doesn't that feel good? Doesn't it feel wonderful to know that you are God's, that he claims you. He says, he's mine. She's mine. Doesn't that feel wonderful when the devil tries to attack and, and throw storms your way and when there's a hurricane going on or a tornado in your life, you can say, I am his. 
And that's the creator speaking. That is the God of our universe, of galaxies, the creator of these magnificent stars. That is your God. I'd like to go with you because of, of time. You're going to hear me allude to that several times. Which, by the way, I also want you to know I've told everyone in every service, and by the third time you preach this sermon, I, I think I've memorized it now, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad I got two tries already. But I want you to know that I, I mentioned to them as well, I, I, I travel, as I told you, through so many different churches in the state, and my worry, and if you, if you only knew that us preachers get nervous and worried, and I'm trying to do a good job and not show it to you, but, but we all get nervous and we're terrified. We're in front of a lot of people and it's being recorded and I'm going to make a mistake somewhere, somehow, throughout the sermon, and then somebody's going to email you or text you or hold it to you, and you get nervous, and one of those things that you get nervous about at least me, I know that this is not many of your situations, but I get worried, and, and when I got up to preach in the first service, I said, thank you, Jesus, the pulpit is a perfect size. I go to some churches, and the pulpit is up here, and I have no choice <laughs> but to preach outside of the pulpit, but I'm so glad that you're a pastor. Thank you for choosing this pulpit. I, 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 I will come back just, just because of your pulpit. This is great. I feel so much better this morning as I try to hang on to it. But let's go together to the book of Genesis, first book in the Bible, and I'd like to go with you to, to chapter, um, let's go here to chapter 37, verse 12. Chapter 37, verse 12, Jesus cares for you. We're going to use one story, one illustration in the Bible of how God cares for you. In verse 12, Chapter 37, it says, Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, As you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I am going to send you to them very well, he replied. Now that sounds beautiful and that sounds great and we can read it really quickly. But we know there's more to the story. I can't wait to make it to heaven even if I'm the last one to sneak in through the gates I can't wait to get there because I'm going to ask about some of these stories. And here as the story of Joseph begins, as we start to read it, it sounds like a very simple story. Here Israel, the father, says, says come here, Joseph. I'm going to send you. I'm going to give you some of these things. You just run on up to where your brothers are at and give it to them. And all of a sudden, this teenager, and we know that all teenagers are so obedient, it sounds like, like Joseph just goes and says, absolutely, Dad, I'll do anything anything and everything you want me to do because I love you, Father, and I will obey you in everything. That sounds like your teenagers, which is, which is great, Pastor Patterson. That's great. Mine too. I got to be careful. I have my 15-year-old here. Orlando, that, that's you. So all of a sudden, I'd like to, to plant to you what, what, what's going on. Verse 14, so he said to him, this is Israel speaking. He said to him, go and see if all is well and your brothers and with the flocks and bring word back to me. Then he sent him off to the valley of Hebron. Hebron. So now Joseph is on his way to see his brothers. Now you got to understand a little bit of the story and what's going on because for some reason Joseph is still at home and I don't know about you but, but that doesn't seem right. Joseph is at home. Have you ever asked, why is Joseph at home? Why are his brothers working under the sun, sweating, but Joseph is at home? The story will continue to tell us a little bit. Verse 18, but they saw him in a distance, and before they reached the, he reached them, what did they do? They plotted to kill Joseph. Whoa. Whoa. That story just switched on us. It just flipped. So here's this boy that dad loves very much. Here's this boy that for some reason he's still at home and not working with his brothers. He's a teenager. He's a young man. So, so I would say send them off. Put him to work. He can do just like his brothers could. So his brothers, for some reason, they have this, this resentment. There's something there because not, you know, I don't know about you, but no one wakes up and just says, yeah, I want to kill my brother. That's not normal. And those things don't happen overnight. 
So, so I don't know the story, remember, and, and I'm going to ask God and Jesus in heaven. I want to know more details to a lot of the stories that are in the Bible. But I'm pretty sure that the brothers were, were sick and tired of Joseph. He was a spoiled brat. I mean, he's at home. Well, he should be over here working. And there's Joseph at home, spoiled. And not just spoiled, he gets to spend time with dad while I have to be working. And not just, not just spend time with dad and, and, and parents. I don't know if this is good counsel, but, but I don't think it was wise for, for the parents, for dad, to give Joseph a coat that would separate him from his brothers. I mean, not for nothing, but I don't think that's wise. I remember when I had my, 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 my two little boys and they were little, I remember my wife and I, as we learned, and all the baby dedications, I just want to give you some counsel, Eric, uh, and, and I'm sure you're going to have many more. So, so, so when you have another, another child, another little boy or little girl, we made the mistake. We made the mistake in our home. My wife and I would go to Target or Walmart, and, and we would buy two, two little Hot Wheels, right, for my, or two little boys, and we would buy a little Corvette for one and a little Camaro for the other. If you're parents, you know that doesn't work. And we learned very quickly that Orlando would want Isaac's Corvette and Isaac would want Orlando's Camaro. So we learned very quickly. And what did we do? We just got two Corvettes the next time. Same color, same year, same everything. <laughs> that's, that's what we do as parents. For some reason, this godly man, this wise individual, this great father, he puts a separation between the boys. I mean, here are the boys with a regular dark blue coat, and here is Joseph with this coat that doesn't even need the sun to shine. It's just, it shines. He's different. And that you could tell, just that, there was a lot more. You remember the dreams? I mean, not for nothing, but I would love to see my 15-year-old come home and tell my 13-year-old that he's going to bow in front of him one day. What do you think would happen in my home? How do you think we would have to react as parents? But there, this, this, this teenager, this kid, this young man would go to his brothers and say, I had a dream. I'm sure the brothers were saying, stop eating at 10 o'clock at night. Those are nightmares. Those are not dreams. And he would say, no, no, this is from God. This is a dream. And you're going to bow down one day to me. Yeah, Joseph, that didn't go over too well. So the brothers see him coming. And, and no wonder they said, we're going to get rid of this guy of this spoiled brat. We don't know why he's special. Why is he different? He's not even the oldest. He's a kid. And dad, for some reason, they give him everything. He gets the largest portions. He gets the nicest coat. He gets to stay home. He doesn't have to work. Why? So these brothers are, are ready to kill Joseph. Verse 19, chapter 37, Genesis says, Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him, throw him into one of the pits, and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. Wow. I tell you, you, you don't have to go and watch a movie or a Netflix series to get better than this. You don't. The Bible is full with respect, but the Bible, you want drama. This is beautiful. You want action? It's coming. You want romance? It's there. Wait, we're going to get there. Potiphar's wife. Little romance, little action, little drama. It's there. So I tell you, young people, adults, whether you're new in the church or not, read the book. Read the Bible. Dig into this word. Man, it's exciting. When you first read it, you go, whoa, what's going to happen to Joseph? Who would dare to, to, to throw this guy in a pit and kill him and then go tell dad that he died by a ferocious animal? How could they live for the rest of their life with those lies? When you watch all these things, that's what it is. There's lies and there's adultery and there's drama and there's action and there's killing and there's... I mean, this story is incredible. Continues, and it, and it says in, in verse 21, when, when Reuben, here we go, a hero, 
Here's the, here's the movie. Here's the plot. Here, here's the hero. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the pit here in the desert, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to the father. So, wow, all the brothers aren't bad. There's one. There's one that's going to wait, throw him in the pit. He's going to come at night. He's going to take his brother. He's going to say, Dad, my other brothers wanted to kill him, but I know what you have taught me, what you have shown me. Here's your son, your favorite son. The movie gets better. Continues. And it says, so, so when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe. Here, here's the action. The richly ornamented robe he was wearing. And they took him and threw him into the, 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 the pit or cistern. And now the, the pit was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, imagine that. You throw your brother. You're going to kill your brother. And now you go and you can, and you can eat. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. So imagine, now the brothers, they set out to do what they were going to do. They throw Joseph in this pit, and then they see these merchants, these people that are coming to sell their things in Egypt. Can you imagine placing yourself in Joseph's shoes? Can you imagine being in that situation? Can you imagine living in a home where from birth you're given everything that you need, everything that the, the parents could give you? Can you imagine your, your brothers then as you grow, you're just following God's ways. You're just following what God has given you and, and taught you and, and the dreams. You're just bringing the message of God to, to your brothers and your family. Imagine being in Joseph's shoes. All of a sudden, the people you love, the people that are supposed to embrace you and be there for you, your blood, your own blood sets out to kill you. I don't think it gets any worse than that. And even there in that pit, and if you look up, imagine being in the pit. Imagine trying to get out. It's dark. There's nothing you can do. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going on. You know when you've heard the words that they've screamed and shouted at you. You know they've stripped you from your clothes. This can't be good. Imagine being in that situation with Joseph. I dare to say even there, Joseph did not give up on Jesus. Even there, Joseph said, I know my God. Even there, Joseph was ever able to, to trust in his God. Even there, Joseph remembered what the parents had taught him about their God, about Jesus. And I know that many of you are saying, Jesus, well, Jesus comes in in Matthew 1. No, Jesus was there from the beginning. Go to John 1, verse 1. We don't have the time this morning, but Jesus was there with the Father in creation. Jesus has always been in the Bible. He doesn't come in in Matthew. Jesus comes in in Genesis 1. And he's there till Revelation 22. So there Joseph is trusting in the plan of God, even in the pit of life. And I ask you, and I don't know you, next Sabbath I'll, I'll be somewhere else and the following somewhere else, but I can't stand up before you without telling you that Jesus cares for you. That no matter what pit you're in, he's in there with you. He's not looking at you from the top. He's inside, in the dark, saying, I'm with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I won't destroy you because you're my children. I got to cut the sermon. <laughs> Love you guys. Doesn't your pastor look cool in a on a cajon. You got the coolest pastor. <laughs> All right. It continues. The story continues. And it actually, I'm going to skip down to verse 26. It says, Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay a hand on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers then did what? They agreed. And you guys know the story, right? So all of a sudden, they sell Joseph. Now, they don't just sell him. They take him and 
Potiphar gets a hold of Joseph. If we were able to continue with the story and able to continue to read, it says that at Potiphar's house, Joseph stood out. Do you know why he stood out? Because he was different. He loved Jesus. He loved God. He loved the plan of salvation that was coming. He knew that he could trust in God. He knew that God would never leave him, even though he went from this spoiled young man in this beautiful home to being a slave and a servant. Thrown in the pit, being a slave and a servant, and not once did Joseph ever say, my God has forsaken me. In fact, Joseph trusted in Jesus. Joseph trusted in God. All of a sudden, again, you want the drama, the romance, Potiphar's wife, she throws herself at him because Joseph was a good-looking young man. Oof, that's the Bible. That's not, that's not me making those things up. The Bible actually pauses and says, Joseph was a good-looking man. And Potiphar's wife wanted to be with him. And what did he do? Young people don't think he wasn't tempted. Don't think that wasn't hard. But he trusted his God, and he knew what his father had taught him. He knew that would disappoint his God. He knew that he could not do that to his Savior. So he ran away. And you guys know the story? Because of that, where does he end up? <sighs> Can the story get any worse? But in the pit, in Potiphar's house with Potiphar's wife, and in jail, Jesus never left him. God never forsaked him. God never, ever, ever left him. And it's a wonderful, another good story in the Bible that teaches us as Christians that no matter what we go through, Jesus is there. He cares for you. He'll never leave you. So keep going. Hang on. Don't give up. Don't give up. Jesus is always there. And church family, I know I got to stop. But if you take anything, please always remember that Jesus cares for you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you or abandon you. He loves you. And the best message of all, he's coming soon to make things right and take us home.
is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come one may in the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning. I know I will never be. going to stand and we're all going to sing together and rejoice or continue to rejoice in our Jesus, in our Savior. But I want to leave you with this. At the end of the story of Joseph or towards, in the book of Genesis chapter 41 verse 41, it says, so Pharaoh said this to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Can you imagine that? A young man that had been through so much. I mean, this is years later. He had no clue where God was taking him, but he was always holding his hand. So, 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 so he gets sold, becomes a slave or servant, has temptation, falsely accused, ends up in jail for years, and then what does God do? At the end of the day, God's plan always came through. At the end of the day, it was the same plan for God's people. And you see, the same plan is for you and me. We're going through that time, whether it's good or bad, but God's plan has never changed. You see, salvation didn't come in just in the book of Matthew. Salvation was already in store. God the Father is saying, we got to do something for, for our children. And Jesus comes in, and, and it was Jesus that was sacrificed, and it was Jesus that gave his life, and it was Jesus that resurrected, and it's Jesus. The plan is, it's Jesus that will come and take us home. And that's because he cares. That's our God. The plan was always for Joseph to be there, leading, second in command. The plan for God's children has always been to spend eternity with their father. That's our plan. Isn't that wonderful that we can leave this place knowing that Jesus is coming soon to make things right and to take us home? Isn't that wonderful? We have something to smile about. We have something to sing about. I ask you, let's, let's stand. Let's sing together as we leave. And, and let's rejoice in, in Jesus because there is a plan for us as his people. Let us sing.